Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, but I just wanted to say before, can you hear me? No. Okay. So should I do that? You can just pull it out. I can pull it out. Okay. Okay, so I just thought I would sum up the last session because what we did learn for the people who are not in the know about sort of digital technology, um, there was a lot of new vocabulary that was bad, bantered around, which I loved, and that would be e-textiles, fashion tech, uh, digi, digifab ecosystem, which I thought, thank you, Tom, that was a great uh, term to think about. And I also loved the fact that, Sandra, how you used the word unhanded as a verb, unhanding. This is going to be the craft washing, the unhanding. These are going to be the takeaway buzzwords that we're going to have um, and that we're going to learn about and use. Um, and this is going to be so important about this conference. I also like the fact that everyone on the panel, on the previous panel, sort of had their own kind of pet peeves. And, and, I, and I'm going to welcome these panelists to um, share their pet peeves. And I'm going to give you a few of mine. The one word that is also really overused is the word curating. And everything is a curated experience. And I have been a curator in craft and design for over 20 years. So I'm a little bit miffed when I hear that. Um, I also thought we talk about our children. And now we're not all going to be grumpy people complaining about, oh, the kids today. But it is true that they are losing their hand and motor skills. And one thing that they're, they also can't use are keys. So now we have cars that don't are keyless cars, right, which are very frustrating. So this is part of our digital new society. So that's sort of what we learned from the last session and much more than that. But um, before we move on, I'll, I will tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I was the founding curator at uh, the Design Exchange in Toronto when it first opened. And so uh, at that time, there was really no te digital technology. We didn't even have email or computers. So I would say, and I really realized this by um, participating and, and watching the panel, listening to the panel this morning, is that I have been witnessing the sort of the digital revolution on craft and design for the last 20 years. And it's been very exciting. So as the curator at the Design Exchange, I wrote the book Design in Canada. And what I did know and what I've noticed is that the, because there was such a, a lack of a strong industrial design manufacturing community in Canada, that there has always been a synergy between craft and design and mass production. And I've always called it sort of industrial craft. So this has been going on, and this is our history, and it continues to be that way. More recently, I've been uh, affiliated with the, the Gardner Museum as, as, as chief curator and now as adjunct curator. And one of the last exhibitions I did there, again, is so different from the past. It was, um, and I didn't bring slides because I was encouraged not to, but I showcased the work of an artist named Claire Toomey. And what Claire did, Claire is from Britain, and she is very much about working in multiples. So she will fill a room and create a thousand objects to create an environmental space. And she will use it, you, she'll be able to do this through digital technology. So what she did for us at the Garden Museum and it really is all about making and hand making, is she, uh, digi she uh, it was stereolithography, so she digitized three beautiful 18th century mice and porcelain figures, and then she made molds of them, and then she slip cast a thousand of them to fill the gallery floor. Uh, then she ex uh, presented the three originals on very, very high vitrines or display cases to sort of elevate their iconic status. She then invited makers to actually make th and, uh, these figurines on site an hour a day. So the collection built um, to 2,000 objects. So the whole exhibition installation, Claire Toomey, piece by piece, was really about thinking about craft, production, digitization, the museum, and fetishizing of the object. So that is how far we've come. I've also want to mention that I teach industrial design history at um, 
uh, Sheridan College, and that is a brand new pro program, and it's been led by one of Canada's leading industrial designers, Scott Lawton, and this is a first for Sheridan, because Sheridan, as many of you know, opened in 1967 to really sort of lead in th the crafts of glass and ceramics and furniture, and they still are leaders um, in many ways, but to, they've situated an industrial design part department right in the same uh, corridor with the craft makers and there is a, a lot of a synergy going on. So it is an exciting time for us and I think we'll see a, a lot more in the future. I also want to, before I introduce our illustrious panel, I just want to tell some people in the audience, or many of you probably already know this, but there has been some very um, important works, uh, and, and this conference really follows on the heels of it. Uh, the Museum of Art and Design, the MAD Museum, which dropped the title of Craft uh, in its uh, uh, name because I thought craft was no longer sexy, did a very important uh, exhibition called Out of Hand. And, uh, and that was all about the sort of the idea of uh, objects uh, being made using digital technologies. There was also a new book, if you want to see it uh, or, bought, or purchase it, and it's um, Thames and Hutton, Hudson, and it's very accessible, and it's called The Digital Handmade. So to prepare for this uh, conference, I, I sort of returned to those books and I looked at them, and this is what um, came across, this is what I saw, and you may not like to hear this at some of you uh, makers, is I saw that digital technology for uh, whether you're an industrial designer or a craft maker is something, it's a muse, and it's, it, it's a very exciting uh, way, a tool to find new forms. It's a process. And so consequently, ironically maybe, we have returned to the postmodern era because we are seeing almost a return of historical uh, revival, uh, but now been distorted and manipulated. So we have neo Art Nouveau or neo um, uh, Baroque, or because it can be done so well. And it's exciting to see, but to me it's a bit problematic. It's not cultural pro appropriation that we were talking about in the first session, but it is a, a return to um, a reboot of, if you will, of uh, historical styling. So what I hope our panels will do today, or, or, or what we'll discuss today, in fact, is not just simply how we're doing this, but why. You know, it's not just about form following process, uh, rather than form following function, that old famous dictum. It's something more than that. And I think we are now reaching a stage where we are all so familiar with digital te technologies that we can sort of go beyond looking at really neat things. So with um, no further ado, I have to, sorry, go back to my iPad to introduce our wonderful speakers. Um, so here we have, um, hang on, Greg Sims, uh, and he is a wonderful jewelry designer. And I urge you to, I, I think he'll be showing us some of his work, but uh, he uses a lot of whimsy and, and insight into his um, practice. Uh, he is an artist, a teacher who is based in Toronto. He teaches at OCAD. Um, he has uh, studied and taught at uh, NASCAD. And um, it is um, really exciting to have him here today. Our next speaker, and this is the problem with my digital technology, <laughs> is um, Johanna Baroska. And uh, did I say your name right? I don't, and who uh, teaches at Concordia, right? And um, okay, I have to then, because I can't do your introductions, but I'm going to have to let you introduce yourselves. <laughs> but that's Joanna, why don't you just give a little bit about your bio, and then I'll let. Um, uh, uh, our, our, our last speaker also. So as you'll see uh, from my presentation later, I work with electronic textiles, both in a research context, de developing materials for future textiles, as well as an industrial context, developing biometric um, undergarments. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, my name is Garnet Hertz, and I work at MLA Carr University in industrial design. I uh, work in electronic art, and I'm Canada Research Chair in Design and Media Art. Okay, so 
you want to take it off, Greg? Yeah, sure. I'll, um, you've got to take your mic. I'll see if that works. Is that okay or? Thanks, Rachel. Um, I, first of all, I did want to say thank you to Ryan and uh, Remco just for inviting me to speak today. And thank you all for coming. Um, oh. Okay, I'll, I'll try to coordinate it. Um, so I teach at OCAD University. I, my background's in jewelry, um, but I also teach a lot of digital fabrication um, courses, both undergraduate and at the grad, graduate level. To juggle these things. So I'm just gonna jump right into the presentation. Oops. Starting out in the field of jewelry, I vowed that I would never use the process of casting and mold making, seeing it as directly responsible for all of the bland and boring jewelry that crowded display cases and shop windows. I preferred to work directly with the materials, fabricating pieces in silver, gold, and gemstones, somehow seeing this approach as more authentic. It wasn't until I came across an idea for a set of wedding bands, this one here, uh, requiring casting that I came around to the idea that it wasn't the technique or the materials alone that defined a piece, but rather what you did with them. It was how they were handled and presented that made them successful or not. By knowing many materials and processes intricately, one could master them, combine and employ them in ways that others had not. The more you knew, the more opportunities Having a full understanding allowed you to push the limits. A basic knowledge and limited hands-on experience required you to work within the rules. I adopted digital ways of working, seeing the potential to become more efficient and precise. Lucky for me, the evidence of handiwork, or as I sometimes call it, busy work, was never strongly valued in jewelry. To me, evidence of how a material had been worked or processed came through in other ways, in the strength of the idea and how well it was conveyed. We often hear the adoption of digital techniques described as just another tool. That may be true early on, but to describe digital making technologies as just another tool seems rather naive. Digital design and digital fabrication have completely transformed the way objects are perceived, exist, and come into being. A virtual object can be reconfigured in, with infinite outcomes. The basic premise of building successive layers can be applied to any form, however complex, and to virtually any material. It's more than just a tool. I'm always excited by work that shows a level of understanding and interaction with the digital, exploring new possibilities. In 2013, my colleague Jesse Jackson and I organized and curated, I'm scared to use that word now, but um, <laughs> making, uh, the name of the exhibition was uh, Making It Real. And we sought out artists and designers that were working in this way and who recognized that the rapid prototyping era of digital fabrication and additive manufacturing was an old way of thinking. Objects chosen for this exhibition were no longer just models and prototypes, but had advanced sufficiently to be considered the final material object. The design process, material makeup, and methods of production offered completely new outcomes that took advantage of new technologies and distinguished themselves from what had come before. Many of the designers recognized that these materials and forms had great potential to hold and express meanings in different ways, to be engineered, assembled, in combination with more traditional processes. Doug Bucci's eyelet necklace, deriving its structure from medical data relating to diabetic blood sugar readings is an SLS nylon print whose porous surface is perfectly suited to accept colorful fabric dyes. 
JC Carrick's headphones are assembled straight off the printer with a couple of added magnets and speaker wires. The same nylon material is engineered with varying structures throughout, allowing both rigid and flexible areas as well as snapping mechani mechanisms for quick assembly. Over time, I have noticed that the digital has become a common language promoting interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity and collaboration. It can be a unifying thread, allowing different disciplines to come together, cross over, and reinterpret. I am also encouraged to see that some of the most challenging work adopts a craft approach to creating, where artists, designers, and researchers are engaged directly with the technologies and materials. Here are some more recent examples of this exciting exploration between the digital and the material. Eric Clarenbeek's mycelium project investigates the potential of growing living organisms in the production of furniture. The chair is created by 3D printing a combination of a PLA plastic shell infilled with a slurry of lo local organic yard waste and mycelium fungus. The fungus acts as a binder growing into the rigid mold form provided. Once fully grown and dried, the mycelium becomes a structural, stable, and renewable material. The mushrooms that grow outside of the structure are described by Clarenbeek as decorative jewels. <coughs> Nervous System takes advantage of generative th modeling and 3D printing technologies to create a range of household and wearable products, each individual and fully customized for and by the consumer. Their kinematics project creates a system whereby any 3D form can be transformed into a flexible hinge structure. Objects are made accessible to consumers through an online interface. By keying in inf information and manipulating nodes, the consumer generates a personalized jewelry object that can then be saved, printed, and shipped. Perhaps a perfect illustration of the new material possibilities revealed by the digital experimentation is emerging objects. Take on the Utah tea set, referencing Martin Newell's teapot, one of the first 3D computer models created for graphic rendering. From the teapot's digital incarnation in 1975, emerging objects arrive some 40 years later at an appropriate physical representation. The teapot is 3D printed using powdered tea. <laughs> Emerging Objects is pioneering research in 3D printing using natural materials, from small objects all the way up to architectural installations. Materials printed include coffee, tea, salt, sugar, paper, cement, and more. The fear that digital ways of making would somehow further disconnect us seems not to be the case. Artists and designers are finding creative ways to process materials that make us more connected and a part of things around us and not apart from. Oops. While digitally produced objects and materials can sometimes appear stark and void of human connection, it is what we do with them throughout the process that will create meaningful objects relating to and connecting with people. The digital can help us to perceive and understand objects in new ways. If we pay attention, there are limitless ways to interpret and process the information and present it back imaginatively. It is what an individual brings to the technology that will make it transformative and successful. Objects do not need to carry the mark of the tool or the machine for us to feel a connection. It is all of the fascinating new revelations as this information is processed into material outcomes that offers new insight to the things around us. There is vast potential for objects to connect us to relate, to convey our thoughts and ideas, to reflect and interact, and tell stories about our lives. We no longer just bring objects into our lives. We can insert ourselves into these objects 
and our experience with them becomes more meaningful because of it. Thank you. Oh, I am next. <laughs> All right, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, I work with electronic textiles, which um, are a subset of this field of wearables. As Valerie Lamontagne described, this is a term that actually encompasses an extremely broad range of projects and practices, everything from these like sticker-like sticker electronic tattoos to collaborative, uh, design experiments. It's actually a term that is really used for a very, very broad multitude of um, different work that relates to the body. The current commercial reality, though, is really still grounded in what we, uh, in, the, in, the, in the VC, in the venture capital world, call the early adopters. So usually males of a certain age and socioeconomic class who do a lot of exercise and want to track their performance, their fitness levels. So those various devices that are usually wrist-worn these days then connect to apps that track, analyze, compare, and link to social media. Uh, other than these wrist-worn devices, there have been some experiments in penetrating the rest of the body through uh, jewelry-like straps, uh, head-mounted displays, etc. But in general, um, the commercial field of wearables is still deeply anchored in this industrial design device uh, reality. So my work, in contrast, has been to focus on the rest of the body, so to actually engage with everything beyond the wrist. I even talk about beyond the wrist interaction and therefore to specifically look at textiles, which are materials we already engage with on our bodies on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, however, to take those textiles and to push them further, to augment them, to actually use traditional ways of making as much as possible, but to replace some of the core materials with a new, uh, functional fibers. So everything from very simple, you know, silver threads that can then allow us to weave sensors into garments. So I actually, I work for OmSignal in my spare time. So I helped to develop, well, I developed all the IP for the OmSignal um, biometric shirts for actually the ways that we knit all of the ECG, the heart sensors, and the breathing sensors into the shirts themselves. So our first shirt was a Ralph Lauren branded uh, Polotech product. Um, what's really important to me is to work as much as possible within the tradition of making and manufacturing. Manufacturing for the very reason that we do want to manufacture these objects, and making because ways of making that allow us to make the prototypes, and I guess I'm using the word making to refer to short-run productions or individual prototypes as opposed to manufacturing, which is scaling at cost. Um, because what I call making actually is an extremely technologically rich history. So weaving, knitting, those are very complex technologies that have been around for hundreds, even thousands of years, that actually contribute a lot to the integrity of the objects that we make. So by using and respecting these histories of making, but adding new kinds of fibers and coatings and processes, we can actually create these objects that have additional functionalities. So not only clothing our body, um, you know, these, uh, these um, signal shirts also have antimicrobial uh, treatments so they don't smell too bad if you sweat in them a lot. They also are these circular knits that help you with your posture. So they have a lot of traditional textile functionality. 
uh, as well as some of this digital textile functionality insofar as they give you a very accurate uh, signal of your heart activity, not just your heart rate, but your full heart signal, as well as your breathing and your movement, etc., that will allow you to reach, develop new insights into your um, into your body, what's happening. The current applications deal with sports, but there is huge potential, both on the utopic and dystopic end of things, for crowdsourcing this information uh, to develop deeper insights for either good or nefarious purposes. Um, beyond this idea of the quantified, and this is where my pet peeve comes in, um, working with students, working with designers in my many collaborations, my main pet peeve is as soon as we engage with these new materials, with this materiality that allows us to develop um, electronic, interactive, mediated kinds of garments, I find that our minds slip into a product kind of mindset. <laughs> so even beautiful artifacts that are created smell like products. They don't smell like craft anymore. What do I mean by that is the concepts become simpler. So working with this new materiality, these smart textiles, these interactive textiles, suddenly it's not just about a pleasurable, bizarre experience. And this is work from my research lab, XS Labs, where we actually try to still engage with these very experimental, these are energy generating garments that are by their very nature uncomfortable. This one is called itchy and it's very itchy. And as you move and you scratch yourself, you actually generate energy, right? Uh, and, and the energy then powers these lights around your neck, which references kind of like safety beacons and a state of emergency and actually highlights the discomfort of the garment. You know, so I try to actually, while developing these new materials and while developing the methods for uh, these future textiles, to still engage with the playful, perhaps pleasurable, perhaps um, well, performative, of course, but also almost, you know, um, well, the complexity of what object making has been historically, right? And my huge pet peeve is that working with these electronic materials switches designers and maybe a lot of artists as well. I was just reading critiques of the Ars Electronica Festival, but I won't get distracted by that. <laughs> uh, but switches the minds of designers and craftspeople to a product-like way of thinking, meaning this has to have a certain use, it has to solve a certain problem, and it has to be good. Right? It has to be something that not necessarily can sell, but that has a purpose that can be defined in one sentence. So that's my pet peeve about these new materials. Um, I'll just finish, I'll skip through a couple of the slides and just finish about, with uh, talking about my current deep interest in these new materials and my relationship with these new materials because um, I think it's very important to respect the history of both making and manufacturing and just build on top of that. And this is where the huge potential of making uh, these augmented artifacts and experiences will come to fruition if we can actually use existing factories, existing looms, etc., but adapt them to integrate these conductive fibers or the other fibers I'm developing in collaboration with scientists, fibers that will replace capacitors, batteries, etc., while still being used in traditional making and manufacturing processes. On top of that, there is so much potential to then start um, integrating new ways of making. So uh, I've shown you here a whole list of uh, additive manufacturing and additive um, or prototyping, I guess, techniques available right now. And finally, there is such 
exciting potential to the future of materials and how we're going to work with these materials, not just from the world of electronics, but of course from material science and chemistry. So uh, I look forward to uh, the discussion later about how we can really leverage the potential of this new materiality and a lot of it um, in my opinion, has to come down to training better designers who understand the complexities of these materials without working on a solely superficial gadget, like if I can say that level. Okay, I'm just going to jump through all of these. <laughs> Uh, can people hear me without a mic? Yes. Yeah, OK. Use it. Use it? <laughs> OK, I'll use it. Um, my name is Garnet Hertz. Uh, it's the green thing. Green thing, OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I, instead of talking about my own work, I wanted to talk about my uh, relationship with my 3D printer. <laughs> And it's not, it's not uh, explicitly sexual or anything. Um, but I wanted to bring up some ideas in regards to the adoption of new technology and sort of um, uh, trends and tropes of, of uh, new technologies that I see happening um, with maker uh, technologies. Um, so. I think of, you know, in, or I'm telling, I'll tell this as a story, okay? So, um, in, initially, when working with an old technology, let's say this is clay or uh, ceramic or uh, metal or whatever, foam core, um, you would build it with your hands, and, and it's, this is sort of a representation of the old way of doing something. Uh, and then a new thing comes along, okay? So it has a lot of promise, okay? So um, this I think of as the, you know, I need you so bad phase. Like, I love you, I uh, take my money phase of like Kickstarter. <laughs> where it's like you want to throw your money at, uh, at, a, at a new thing that comes along that is, um, has a lot of promise. It has the promise that it will free you from all of your constraints and it will replace everything. Um, it's like when peanut butter came out, it was uh, projected that this was going to obliterate uh, margarine and, and butter, you know. Or the, the elevator, was going to completely replace stairs. Now, of course, some of this is true, um, but it tends to be overstated uh, during the uh, beginning, especially if it's in a Kickstarter campaign, okay? <laughs> um, but after, and this isn't two weeks later, I thought about this after because um, it takes more than two weeks to get a Kickstarter uh, product. It takes more like a year and a half, but that's another story. So two <laughs> weeks after you get this thing, the material reality of this, this new digital technology sets in. Um, how to calibrate it, the inconsistencies, the limitations. Um, and this is where you are, are working with this new system. Um, and this could be a CNC machine, this could be uh, lots of different things, but 3D printing is sort of the poster child of a lot of um, what we're talking about today. Um, this is where you're, you're still in love with the technology and you're working with it, although you're discovering that maybe that Kickstarter campaign had, uh, was overstating um, the technology somewhat. So after about a month, it's sort of like, well, I guess this only prints in like ugly colored plastic. <laughs> uh, and um, my printer keeps jamming. Um, and okay, after I've printed a bunch of Yoda heads and uh, keychain whatever things, um, 3D modeling is actually quite hard, right? <laughs> um, there, the, there's an aspect of the new technology that has a lot of promise, but there's a lot of fine print. Um, uh, 
and uh, you know you're dis you have problems. You're posting on discussion groups about how <laughs> to fix it. Um, you realize that open source hardware is actually uh, a lot of times just uh, kind of an unfinished piece of hardware uh, that doesn't really work very well. Doesn't have good documentation. Not all the time, but sometimes. Um, and then six months later, you. Or this, this is in my case, maybe some people go faster or slower through this process. So it's sort of coming to an understanding uh, that, uh, that you're in a, you become into a settled relationship with this thing. Or it's like, okay, yes, this, this technology is, is great. It, it, has a, it has a really useful place in, in a lot of what I'm gonna do. But I'm not going to immediately drop all of my uh, tools for making models out of foam core. Uh, I'm not going to um, stop welding or uh, using a drill press, you know. Um, this, is, this is something that's really useful. So you sort of get into this domestic relationship with this, with this device. And you print, you know, the odd Pikachu head or whatever <laughs> off of it for your kids or whatever. Um, and then for me at least, I. Uh, uh, with new technologies, I mean, I tend to be quite nostalgic in my work. Um, I think after working with this thing for a while, you sort of think like, oh, wow, like I sort of miss that uh, getting my hands dirty in uh, plasticine. Or um, I, I uh, really miss grinding metal, you know, or, or, or something. Um, and so I think a lot of people go through a cycle where this this nostalgia comes up. And this is really, really powerful stuff. You know, you see vinyl um, re-emerging kind of as the zombie media form from the past or uh, mixtapes or uh, Pokemon. Or, I mean, you, you, <laughs> nostalgia is, is really, really powerful. And, it, and, 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 there's, um, and there's a lot embedded. It's not just nostalgia. It has to do with history. It has to do with culture has to do with the uh, old frying pan that you inherited from your grandmother. You know, there's a lot of things that are wrapped up in that, that, that new technology can only partially intervene in. Um, so then, and I think this is, where, this is where things are interesting. You know, after you've worked with this new technology, blending in the new technology with the older stuff, that, that, that's uh, supposed to be like a bl that blob of that old thing getting fed into this uh, printer. Um, it's sort of moving into an open relationship phase with this technology and not being completely the equivalent of texting it every five minutes. You're sort of in an open relationship with it and you uh, combine the new thing with the old thing. And this is, this is what's really interesting, you know, people extruding, uh, you know, coffee or tea or ceramic um, this is where there's a lot of promise and a lot of interesting stuff. Glass, mixing the old with the new. Um, and eventually, I think, I mean, of course, digital technologies change everything, right? We all are staring at our phones at the uh, bus stop. We're all uh, texting each other. It, it fundamentally overhauls uh, a lot of stuff. But at a certain point, we, um, I at least think of these things as tools. Of course, some tools are more useful than others. You're obviously going to, I would get more, I get more excited over a uh, 3D printer than I do an orbital sander, right? But um, it, you can, can come to a conceptualization and use of these things as multiple things in your uh, quiver of um, building stuff. Um, and so what, what I think is important, and, and I've seen this in lots of presentations, it's not like this is like a, a trade show where everybody's trying to sell stuff um, or launch a Kickstarter campaign, but um, the, the idea of uh, liberation and supersession that, that I think is useful to uh, take with a grain of salt. Um, so that, um, and, and this is something that's as old as, as uh, communication technology has uh, a couple hundred years since the telephone, t 
television, radio, uh, internet, 3D printing. Um, of course, these things drastically overhaul culture, but they, they usually do not completely supersede us from uh, our material culture, and they, they don't completely liberate us. They're, they're just a part of the sort of plethora of what we're working with and how we build things. And that's it. Thanks. Well, those were three fascinating talks, and I have to say, Garnett, you, I mean, Dell, you really um, <laughs> hit some of the issues that I've been thinking about and that we've all been thinking about, and it's the idea of how we fetishize um, the process of making and these uh, digital tools. What I think is quite fascinating um, from your discussion is the fact that you still need skill even if you're uh, handling these digital technologies. And of course, we know that skill is very much locked into the idea of craftsmanship, because we are here today to really talk about the sort of marriage between craft and, and, and technology and design, and that issue which Sandra raised that Goethe had pointed out the problem, you know, so many years ago that if, if objects are mechanically produced or reproduced, do they lose their inspiration, their aura, their ability to transform us? And I think, you know, we all know now, I would, I, I could ask this question, but I think we all know the answer that, that craft is no longer locked into the handmade. That's just a redundant question. We know that from students today, the fact that we all need our technologies. But what are, so, 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 so it is liberating to have these technologies. It is also a problem. So can we talk a little bit more in detail about some of the drawbacks of digital technology? Um, now you, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you first, Joey, because I, I thought it was quite interesting, unless I misunderstood you, your pet peeve was that designers or craft makers were still thinking about functionality. And I thought, well, why, why is that so bad? Like, rather than just looking at it as pure sort of indulgence and experimenting with materials. Why is that a drawback? They're thinking of functionality from the mindset of a venture capital uh, kind oh, of yeah, sales okay. pitch, sure. okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like how can I develop something that solves a problem that can get funded? Mm -hmm. So they're not necessarily thinking about funding, but that is the world that they've experienced. Mm -hmm. Digital, in my, in my uh, domain, right, which is wearables. That's how they've experienced wearables. And it's very difficult for them to then imagine a wearable that isn't a sales pitch, if I can put it in those terms. What's, you know, um, what's really interesting about electronic textiles is that they merge functionality. So, uh, so you still have the textile functionality. It can mm -hmm. keep you warm. It can change the way your body moves. Um, it can drape on your body in a different way with electronic interactive functionality, sensors or shape change or color change or lights, communication, all kinds of things. The biggest potential for the future of these materials is once you merge these two different functionalities, is that actually form becomes function. What I mean by that is if you have a textile that's woven with conductive threads, if you cut it here, the resistance will be different than if you cut it here. So you can actually, by changing the shape of the garment, of the textile, you're actually changing the resistance, which then changes the electronic circuit, which changes the interaction. And there's so much subtlety that can be achieved by actually designing with these materials, as opposed to what we're seeing coming out of research labs at Google, for instance, with their project Jacquard, where the collaboration with Levi's, they have pants, and they're just weaving a three by three matrix so you can control 
your, I think it's your um, speakers or something, right? You can actually change the sound level on your speakers on your headphones or something like that. So imagine, you know, having that same textile, but actually using it to perhaps, um, I mean, this is cheesy too, but perhaps, you know, look at pictures of your baby. <laughs> I have a newborn baby, so that's what I do all day long. <laughs> um, you know, but something that perhaps is more personal or less about this yeah. functionality that comes with consumer electronics. Greg, what, do you want to speak a little bit about what I, some of the drawbacks that you've encountered, either through teaching or curating or making? Sure, I guess, um, to me, I guess, and this came up in some of the other talks too, is, is that seduction. Mm -hmm. It's, and that's, yeah, that's one of the drawbacks, I think, is that initial, the initial stage of, yeah, this can, this, uh, the sleek new material or smart textile or um, or technology, and that people only sort of don't don't work beyond that. That it's mm -hmm. it's just this surface interaction, and the results that come out of that are very yeah, just limited. Well, they're lost in the process, right? And the difficulty of achieving what they want to their what they want to make. Yeah, and. It's, to me, it's more, um, it's, the exciting stuff comes later on once people have sort of gone through it, um, maybe later on in the relationship, as Garnett was saying, um, where they're understanding it, they're interacting with it, and then they start to notice the other possibilities that come out. To me, those are the really exciting things, that um, those potential things that, that can come up. Um, I, I think that, um, I'm assuming that you were going to ask me to speak next. Um, <laughs> it, it's interesting because I, I used to teach in a computer science department and, um, and it's different now teaching in an art school, but teaching in a computer science department to what I consider to be average Californian kids. I would just give them a hunk of Play-Doh uh, and give them a prompt to think through an idea and make something with their hands. And it was like, they're like, oh my god, there's this thing. I mean, they found it very engaging. Like, um, it's an interesting exercise. I don't know if, if I'm assuming there's some teachers here. but. Um, but just giving people a hunk of Play-Doh sometimes was just like, it, 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 people were very engaged with this stuff and, and, and uh, their sort of return to this uh, uh, craft be, yeah, partially because of such a saturation of sort of screen time that, that, that just a hunk of Play-Doh is very kind of novel kind of interface for, for a lot of people. It's, it's different teaching at an art school because people are kind of schooled in, you know, polishing stuff and sculpting stuff. Um, they have a different relationship, but um, limitations are, uh, I think, just getting kind of, after you've made your little LED blink, after you've printed up your uh, thing that you've downloaded on your 3D printer, it, it, it then poses a, a much harder question of uh, why you're making it. And uh, you can have the best technology in the world, uh, fabrication technology, and you can still put through pretty bad ideas. The, the technology will give you a lot of opportunity to try out new stuff, but um, I've seen terrible, terrible things um, at the facility, <laughs> at the university that I was working at. They had this multi-million-dollar uh, metal sintering uh, machine, like insane machine, and they were like printing like uh, rims for cars or just knickknacks of just junk, you know, like are doing a 3D print of like somebody's modified like dash for their car. That was, it was not really, I mean, it could be kind of interesting, but 
but it really, really wasn't if you, if you saw it. So having the new technology is only kind of part of the step and can open a lot of doors, but it's not, um, it doesn't solve the problem of what, uh, what you're building and why, why are you doing it. I'm going to open it up to the audience, but I do have one more question, and it's really about access and technology, because all of you are affiliated with, with institutions. Uh, at the Gardner Museum, when we were working with Claire Toomey and we wanted to scan an object and then uh, reproduce it uh, digitally, we had to go out of house. And what I found it was very interesting because we went to East Toronto and where they had the big, huge stereolithography machine, but they didn't have the scanner to do the sort of reverse engineering, if you will. So they brought in a subcontractor who literally had his little scanning machine. It was like the size of a portable, old-fashioned, you know, uh, radio. Uh, sorry, not a radio, but um, a stereo turntable. And he did it there. And so it still had, to me, a real sort of garage band, uh, DIY kind of atmosphere to, to it. So I'm just wondering, where will we go? Where will the technologies go for the general public? Will we at, at one point be able to access these technologies really uh, uh, even um, more readily than we can now? Anyone feels free to jump in? I can, I can start off maybe. Um, in at, I teach at OCAD University, mm -hmm. and that's always a question. Um, it's OCAD sort of asserting itself as a university, and with that, they've, I think they've they've sort of pushed away their um, their tie to uh, the traditional shops and mm -hmm. and and sort of elevated design to this um, um, yeah to this academic pursuit, and. It's, it gets lost a little bit because there, there's less time for people to interact directly with the, the technology to um, sort of get that hands on. Um, and um, to me, that's, that's where it happens. That's where the connections are made. Um, sort of uh, removed from that, it's, um, that's where you're sort of just working on the surface. Um, at the same time, there's, um, I think it's easy, and, and this is what I'm trying to get my students to do, is not to worry about what's sort of right in front of them, um, what technology they can, they can sit there and work with, but to realize that this technology is at their fingertips um, outside of the university, mm -hmm. outside, and all they have to do is sort of make those connections, speak to the people running them, mm -hmm. and it's easy enough for them to kind of get in, see some results, and understand exactly what that material and that machine can do. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to own the machine. They don't have to, it doesn't have to be in their space necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but as long as they're, as long as that approach of, of sort of learning it, understanding it, and then responding is, is taken up, then that's where I think they can go deeper with it. What about uh, in Vancouver, uh, Del, what's that? Is it accessible outside of Emily Carr, or what's happening there in terms of these digital labs? Um, in terms of the accessibility, I mean, universities are, I mean, it's, it's quite accessible inside of the university for students, but, um, and there definitely is a move to, to sort of hacker space everything, uh, which is interesting, and, and a lot of good has come out of it. But I mean, I see the most interesting stuff happening in libraries, in uh, different museums and different spaces that are kind of set up to service the public um, already. Within, within universities, you have all sorts of kind of uh, bureaucratic hierarchies and uh, minor turf wars and uh, shop techs versus <laughs> professors or whatever, you know. Um, it's sometimes complicated, you know, and um, you end up having small little uh, miniature ivory towers <laughs> of, of labs, you know. Um, but it, it really depends on the people who, who are working there. Um, I mean, I found, it, I found actually Emily Carr to be quite open, but I think, I think the fascinating kind of area is, uh, 
and there's an interesting example of Art Engine uh, uh, discussing with uh, Art Engine about uh, the hacker space in uh, you know at uh, in Ottawa here, funded by the uh, uh, U.S. Embassy, which is a whole other can of worms. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, uh, libraries are really fascinating places. But um, yeah. So uh, if I can just answer uh, or Joe. jump in for this as well, just for a second. Um, you know, our students or our young people might have lost some of their skills in making things with their hands, but they've developed other skills with their hands for Googling things and you know, surfing the web. And I even find that many of my students no longer come to my class you know, to learn some of the technical things because they've already learned it on their own. Uh, by watching YouTube videos, whatever, working on their own. Um, some of them come to my classes to learn the technical things. Some of them already bring the knowledge with them. Um, and once they do develop that knowledge, a lot of them choose not to use the facilities at the university for some of the reasons that you've mentioned, but also for cost reasons. There's actually, uh, depending on the machine, depending on the access policy, et cetera, it actually might be easier for them to go outside to the maker spaces and, uh, or libraries, et cetera. Um, so I think a question of access to that demographic I would say would perhaps no longer be an issue. I don't know if anybody disagrees with that. It's not my area of expertise. <laughs> Brian? Um, I just wanted to go back to uh, the question of materiality and wondering in some of the presentations, um, you know, what you learn about uh, technique and being bound up in, in the material that you're using. Um, have you had experiences where then, um, say, using these new materials that you're talking about, or these new ways, um, has that then transformed the experience of using what older materials or, or ideas of traditional materials? Not, not necessarily just because of the, the technology that you can sort of enact with it and, and you know, ram it through the 3D printer if it's T, but, but that something about working with new materials in their, in their new experiences and transforming something that you're, you're doing. So um, I think general. I mean, just speaking more generally. I mean, the short answer is yes for my own work. But more generally, I think it's really, really interesting and often uh, quite unnoticed how, when new stuff comes out, the old sort of paradigms of stuff go through a radical kind of transformation, trying to keep up and do a lot of evolution after their sort of obsolescence is is announced, whether it's um, you know, the music industry, whether it's um, uh, uh, video games, you know, when, when uh, video games, arcade, digital video games came out, pinball machines went through this crazy transformation. Um, sort of the, the new, all, all, you know, as soon as the death bell rings for something old, then, then the old thing wakes up and just panics and uh, reshifts and reconfigures itself, and it's and it's really kind of an interesting phenomenon in general. So I think I think that's definitely happening with um, uh, with uh, with uh, in a lot of different a lot of different areas in a lot of different industries with digital technologies. Is that that the old stuff is. Uh, it's responding, you know, in an interesting, and I, I, I think but it's but a productive way. Can I, I would say, how is it responding? Because visually, as a curator, what I'm seeing is a facelift. I'm seeing the old being repackaged into the new, whether it's more complex a form, whether there's <coughs> more voids in it. But can we talk about that a little bit deeper? Like, is it transforming old ways or practices? It's a, it's a profound question. And I don't know that how, what is the answer to that? Or can we I think part that? of it, part of it is um, that it goes completely in the other direction, you know? As you get more refined, um, uh, more machine made, let, let's say, like for example, the um, uh, Walmart, 
type of products, mass consumer products, I think, you know, help launch DIY kind of movements, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a response where you have definitely like a knee jerk reaction against, you know, you have such a, a massive trend that you, you know, have people going directly in the opposite direction or with music, with digital downloads spurring on, you know, uh, cassette mixtapes, you know, that you have this, the more refinement and more machine made, you have sort of this uh, contrasting kind of flow that's always kind of pushing against stuff. So I, I really see the resurgence of craft being, being, you know, tied into the internet. You know, um, digitization, virtual reality, and, or, or whatever, uh, information superhighway, people just sort of going like, well, yeah, I mean, I like knitting, and uh, <laughs> that's not going away, and, and rediscovering that, you know? Are there any questions from the audience? Um, for Josie. Thank you very much. It was, it's very, very interesting. There's just one thing that I would like to maybe just direct my question at Garnet to start with. Um, you've talked uh, in a very concise and clear way about uh, like a relationship, the evolution of a relationship between the maker and let's say the new technology. Um, and w where does the rapid pace of things insert itself here? Because You've all alluded to the fact that when somebody gets seduced initially by new technology, they try their hand at things that are fairly, you know, that come easily to everybody. And then after that, there's a need for a period of, of pushing the boundaries and exploring further. I know many makers who are in that phase of, um, of honeymoon with new technology, but as soon as they experience this honeymoon phase, and they would, they would be then moving on to the point of exploring and pushing boundaries. Technology has changed already, and then they turn to be uh, in a phase of honeymoon with the next technology. <laughs> and so, uh, how, what do you see the impact of this being on the fact that uh, do makers already have, will have the time to actually be afforded that period of, of thinking and pushing the boundaries before two or three iteration of the tech, new technology is already there and make obsolete what they've, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's yeah. moving so fast. Yeah, I mean, there's sort of, it's definitely sort of like a seduction, you know, of, of new stuff always churning and it's, you know, good for the economy or bad uh, for the world, depending on how you look at it. Um, and yeah, some people never get, just always are hopping on the new media, kind of. It doesn't matter what the new thing is, it's just always sort of like this addiction to your next kind of thing on the cover of Wired or, or, or whatever. Um, some people, yeah, of course, some people never, never go beyond that. Um, and some of the some of the work that people do with 3D printers is just like very ordinary, just simple stuff. And I guess I guess that's okay. I mean, maybe not. No, I don't think everybody needs to be making you know groundbreaking kind of stuff. Um, but I don't know. I I mean, in terms of if we bring this back to like Maker Fair and like the maker kind of movement, I do kind of see some more reflection um, coming into that scene where, you know, after criticism over something like military funding or criticism over the organizations having sort of questionable political kind of agendas, I see that that community is responding and, and talking about issues of accessibility and gender politics. Um, I mean, not really too much talking about it, but kind of acknowledging it and starting to ask stuff like that. So I, I, uh, I think that that scene is kind of uh, starting to ask those questions, I think. But not Next everybody. Question. Next question. 
could we all agree uh, on what uh, um, Greg just said at the beginning, that what we, whatever thing is the thing we, we are talking about, if it is a thing, is not, it is not a tool, but more probably uh, a desire or uh, an obsession. Um, I mean, I threw that out because I think it, it, um, the, the idea of just a tool, it maybe sort of down, downplays um, the potential. Because really, um, as you start to um, sort of immerse yourself in some of these technologies, you start to see things in a different way. Um, I do, yeah, I don't, I don't know... Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know if I would, um, sorry, I'm getting tripped up here. <laughs> um, the, uh, by saying that, the idea that it's, it's more than just a tool, it's, it's just the, 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 uh, the scale of it or the, uh, the, the potential that there's suddenly this, um, it's more than just a material relationship that we have with these objects now. There's, um, there's this, uh, virtual way that we can interact with them. And to me, I think there's a lot of um, space in between that, that um, the, the digital and the material that, that we're just beginning to explore. And those are the, those are the exciting and, and some of the ones that I was trying to show today is where people are, are picking up um, sort of within that space between the digital and, and the material. Um, so, yeah, the, just a tool at, at times, yes, it's, uh, it's a tool, um, but it's a, a very powerful tool, and I think it, the implications are much bigger uh, than maybe some other tools that have uh, uh, preceded it. Sorry for the awkward time to take me to run. Um, wonderful panel. It just occurred to me as we're discussing that so far um, we're all professors and uh, so I just, I don't know how, the, I mean, it sort of fits into everyone's argument, but for a year I directed a lab at Silk du Soleil because they wanted to bring in um, innovation and, and again new fabrication models and they have things like a body scanner and they use a, a, a scanner to scan all the performers across the world so that they can make customized, so they make uh, customized suits for everyone. Um, but it was a tremendous challenge because within the hierarchy of this creative industry, you have people who have ideas and all of a sudden they have to talk to an engineer who's maybe like a, a lighting engineer or, you know, or, or like a 3D uh, engineer and they have to be sort of humbled by their lack of knowledge in that field. And so it was a terrible misfit from, um, you know, also like a kind of like, um, it, it's not, it's a difficult place to R&D right now, you know, the profit margins. So I guess my question is, is there a way, um, and I think um, um, on our previous panel, we talked a little bit about opening up these labs, but I think this transferring of knowledge to industries that really need to rethink their approach because we have the high-tech industries like gaming and you know robotics, but most of the other industries actually don't know how to retool or to reintegrate these creative ways, including fashion. Mm -hmm. Joey, do you want to add to that? Or yes, I mean, I can talk specifically about my experience developing the Ralph Lauren product, mm -hmm. you know, because um, We've all seen tons of prototypes for biometric shirts, and a lot of even big brands have had uh, or have announced products that were maybe available online, but then not really. Um, most of the products that have been announced have not actually been manufactured at scale. It's an extremely difficult problem to make an electronic garment in a manufacturing context. Uh, I mean, there's a very good reason we don't have sensors in all of our garments yet. It's a very, very hard manufacturing problem. Um, so in our case, you know, the only reason it was possible is that we had three players involved, OmSignal, 
whose very survival hinged on the success of this product. <laughs> then Ralph Lauren, who um, their survival did not hinge on this product, but they were very much invested in developing this. And they had the capital, not just financially, but also in terms of their influence within the industry to make sure that our third partner, the manufacturer, would not give up. Uh, all of us at different points wanted to give up. It was, it, no, it took three years instead of three months. Um, and it's extremely, extremely hard. You know, so I had that slide where I talked about additive manufacturing and manufacturing plus plus, et cetera, and it sounds so seductive. But it's much more about just putting a new machine in a factory or putting a new machine in a maker space, right? Um, there is, um, and that's why, you know, it's not just a tool. So specifically for the Ralph Lauren biometric shirt, you didn't only have to kind of train the people on the floor on like, look, you can't stitch through this because it'll be a short circuit. It was actually a whole fundamental organizational shift within the whole uh, factory, right? So they had to change the way they do costing. They had to change their management approach. We had to change the way that they do sourcing. Um, um, and I'm happy to talk about <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk about this for hours. So I'm happy to talk about this over lunch with anybody who's interested. But it was such a deep uh, organizational shift within that factory, you know, that c'est pas évident, as they say in French. It's not easy. It's not simple. Um, and also, I think there's this perception with digital technologies that it's easy and you should be able to achieve mastery quickly, right? And ideas don't catch up to how easy it is to make the first kinds of things. And, you know, I actually have a question that somehow relates to this I wanted to pose to the panel or even to the audience because I'm not sure what the answer is. Is there a qualitative difference between somebody who, like, let's say, goes to their community art center and takes a drawing class and makes a couple of crappy drawings, and then next uh, session takes a painting class and makes a couple of crappy paintings, and they're like, okay, that's not for me, and then makes a glass blow that takes a glass blowing class and then takes a ceramics class, right? And compare, is that a process that's qualitatively different from, you know, using one 3D printer than maybe using an Arduino then being like, oh, okay, well, I made an LED blink, then using some other digital tool? Or is it just part of the same kind of exploration and then some people really get passionate about like, oh my God, ceramics is it for me and I'm going to make a hundred crappy <laughs> ceramics and then I'll get good, right? Uh, and I'll make a hundred crappy 3D prints and then I'll finally be amazing, right? Is there a difference? I don't think so, but maybe there is. I, if, if I could uh, offer just in relation to what you had just said, um, the idea of not just a tool and not just a material, that every tool and everything that you wield um, and it's like, a, if you could imagine it, there's an invisible web that is just spreading out from each of those objects that affects massive amounts of things. So there is a, there is a quantifiable uh, uh, difference between when you handle an Arduino and you handle uh, a 3D printer and, the, and all of the materials that go into it and all of the sort of social, economic, and cultural structures that those exist in. So while there might not be a radical difference for the person involved, um, how we make those things uh, external and evident um, is, is definitely different and possible. Right now, I think, as you've been alluding to in, in some ways in the, in the commercial aspects, we want to make those things invisible um, in the technological. We don't want to think about them. Um, sorry, I don't mean to monopolize, but they give me a mic and I get to interject. <laughs> um, so so how, how much time do we have left? We're, we're getting close to uh, lunch. People are probably getting hungry, so we could maybe um, start to wrap up. Okay. I, I'd like to wrap up. So I have to say I'm still not convinced that I still think it's a tool, but what a tool. <laughs> what an exciting tool, because I think we could talk about the impact of, you know, the steam engine in the 19th century or, or, or so forth. It changes, you know, of course it changes factory plants. Of course it changes access to production. We are just living in this digital re revolution we're often caught up in the process of making and what it can give us. And that's what's so exciting about it. I think that, Greg, you really touched on something that I thought was interesting, and that is the in-between space. And that
that I think is a whole new world particularly for craft makers, is to work in that virtual world and what does that mean? And, and that I hope we can maybe explore that a little bit uh, more in the afternoon. Now, I did think it was very interesting, Joey, that you always said that whatever someone was doing, it was crappy. DIY, <laughs> DIY, crappy, crappy. But that did make me think about anything, and even when Dell was talking about, you know, the challenges of using these uh, um, uh, 3D printers, is the 10,000 hours that we need to to quote uh, Malcolm Gladwell, and that's what we do need uh, to be any uh, to be a master at what we do, and we can't forget that, and we can't sort of only talk about it in this kind of vacuum, but in that larger context. But thank you for this wonderful discussion and great audience.